Hello, everyone, and welcome to the insanity, because this is the most insane thing that I've ever done yet so far. And yet it's still fairly not unexpected. So that says a lot about me. Welcome back to my channel, unless this is your first time seeing me, which it probably is for a lot of you. Hi, my name is Jasmine Zaid. I make music, pop culture, and music commentary videos on my channel. Stick around and subscribe if you want to. I am a fangirl. I love talking about everyone's faves and doing pop culture videos, so... We would love to have you for more than just this video. Basically, there's this new, not really new, but there's been this commentary trend going around where people are doing extraordinarily long deep dives on certain subjects and making these very, very long three to seven hour long deep dives about them. This was very, very inspired by Quentin Reviews, who did a series on Nickelodeon TV shows that were like five hours long. And it was also inspired by Mike's Mike, who did Pretty Little Liars and Glee. I decided as a commentary YouTuber, I wanted to hop in and deep dive a subject. And what subject do I know better than One Direction? Nothing. So today we're going to be doing a complete career deep dive, talking about every single thing that One Direction did in their time as a band together, from the minute they got formed to the minute they disbanded. And it's gonna be a roller coaster. I don't know. Does this video have a real purpose? Absolutely not, especially considering that One Direction is a dead boy band who is not together anymore and probably will never be again. Am I milking it for all it's worth? Absolutely. Will I let them go? Absolutely not. Hence why we're doing this career deep dive. So today we're going to be spending lots and lots and lots of time together going through all these things. So I hope you're buckled in, get a snack, get a drink, wear some comfy clothes, and let's get into this complete look at One Direction's entire career. As you can see, I have some things laid out on my wall for you. As this video continues, the wall will be continuously changing with each era. Right now, we have their first era up on the wall. So today I'm going to be teaching you about One Direction, which means you need to know the members of One Direction first and foremost. Let's talk about them. This is Louis Tomlinson. He is the oldest member of One Direction. He was born in Doncaster, which is in England if you don't know. This is a free geography lesson. You're not learning about One Direction only. You're learning about England. Okay. So he's from Doncaster. He's the oldest member of One Direction. He's a Capricorn. Thank God, fellow Earth sign. No wonder we're best friends. No wonder we're so cosmically connected. Everything makes sense. This is so funny because I do have notes to follow, but I'm doing most of this off of memory. Baby, this is 10 years worth of cult behavior that you're witnessing right now. Anyways, Louis' birthday is Christmas Eve, December 24th, when he was born, the Capricorn. And Louis is not only the oldest member of One Direction, he is also the oldest member of his family in general. Louis grew up with a set of twin siblings and another younger sister. His mother later in life had another set of twin siblings. And then he did have another younger sister who sadly passed away in 2019. The point here is that he's always been the oldest of the bunch. Something that I also want to mention that you guys should keep in mind is that every member of One Direction is associated with a color because they had them wrapped around their mics to separate them. Louis' 1D world of color is blue. I don't know, remember that, I guess? It's not going to come up again. But we're learning about One Direction, so his color is blue. Just He just looks like a blue kind of guy, am I right? Like, look at him. So Louis here grew up very into like music and acting when he was in high school. Don't know what they call it in England. I'm very sorry. But growing up, he was very into music and acting. He knows how to play the piano. He starred in his school production of Grease when he was a teenager. He also actually went to acting school, if you don't know, and did a few small roles in TV and movies over time when he was growing up. And when Louis was 14, he was in a band called The Rogue, which he now has tattooed across his ankles, which I find very beautiful. So Louis being in Greece and the fact that he left the rogue as a vocalist is what led him to audition for the X Factor UK in 2009. He unfortunately didn't make it past the TV producers, which means he never even went on the show, but he said that only encouraged him more and he came back again to audition the following year in 2010. Suspense and madness, I will leave you hanging with that. This is Liam. James Payne, if you will. Liam is from Wolverhampton. Liam was born in late August, making him a Virgo man, which is not ideal, I know. Trust me, I'm right there with you. But it's the facts, all right? Liam is the opposite of Louis. Liam is giving baby of the house. He has two older sisters, and he grew up as the youngest in the house. Kind of like me. I, too, am the baby of the household. Liam is Mr. Red in our One Direction world of color. That's his... One Direction World of Color, by the way, that's not actually what it's called. I just made up the One Direction World of Color, but I think that's a fun name for it. But his microphone color was red, so Liam is a red man. Something about it, again, is just so fitting. Fun fact, Liam grew up actually wanting to be an athlete and not a singer. He's giving Troy Bolton, okay? He was a track star. 
literally. He was a runner. He was a track star. He was part of an athletic club and was ranked third in the entire country at one point for running. Liam got into show business over athletics when he was about 12 and he joined a theater company. And after joining this theater company, he did do a few performances on occasion. This led him to auditioning for The X Factor UK in 2008 at only 14 years old, which is pretty young to audition for The X Factor. Liam, when he auditioned for The X Factor, did make it past the TV producers, made it to boot camp, and made it to the judges' houses, but that is where he got cut by Simon Cowell. Simon told him to return in two years, and Liam took his advice very literally and did return two years later in 2010 to re-audition for The X Factor. The same year, Louis went back to audition. Huh. I wonder what happens next. This is Zayn Malik. Originally born Zayn, Z-A-I-N, but he changed his name to Zayn, Z-A-Y-N, to be fun and cool. I don't know. I like it. <laughs> There's been a debate in the One Direction fandom for years for some reason on whether his middle name is Jawad with the W or Javad with the V, and I simply don't know why this was an argument for so long about his middle name. Kind of funny to me now because we know for sure it is Javad, but I thought I would just throw that in there for funsies. Anyways, Zayn Javad Malik. He is also from England, Bradford, who is surprised, not me. This is a British boy band, if you didn't know. Zayn, unlike Louis or Liam, is a little bit different because he's giving middle child. Middle child. He's not the baby and he's not the oldest. He's just wedged in the middle. He has one older sister and two younger ones. So... Also, Zane's 1D world of color is yellow. Zane, just like Liam and Louie, participated in some performing arts courses, and he did some performances in school. It's actually been noted that when he was growing up, he would sit in class and write his own rap songs, and he grew up around a lot of R&B and reggae music, which is very reflected now in sort of his solo music. Zane only auditioned for The X Factor in 2010. He did not go any earlier like Liam and Louie. His first shot was in 2010, but Zayn almost actually missed his X Factor audition because he was too nervous and he wanted to stay in bed. I'm telling you, me and Zayn are so similar. Like, he is just like me. I, too, simply want to stay in bed when I have to do anything. This is Niall Horan. Plot twist, Niall is not from England. He's from Mullingar in Ireland. And that's like the one fun fact that everyone always uses for Niall. Poor guy. Seriously. I mean that. Niall was born in September. He is a Virgo, just like Liam. Very unfortunate to be introduced to another Virgo man, but it is what it is. We're rolling with the punches. And his 1D world of color is the Irish flag. I wish I was kidding. <laughs> ah! No, no. Like when I say his only personality trait that this band gave him was being Irish, I mean it. His mic colors were the Irish flag. Forgot to mention Zane's birthday is in January. He is a Capricorn. So we have December, August, January, September. Anyways, back to Niall. He taught himself how to play guitar via YouTube videos when he was only 11. And that is how he got into performing arts and music. And after discovering that he liked to sing, he joined a performing arts center where he could do performances. Sorry, I keep blocking Niall. When Niall was 17, he went to audition for The X Factor UK in 2010. And lastly, I know you've been waiting for this. This is Harry Styles. Harry Edward Styles. It's true, he's a really big Twilight fan. Harry grew up in Holmes Chapel, Cheshire, if you will, in England, which is actually kind of funny because Holmes Chapel is like a little village. Like Harry's a little lad boy. <laughs> oh, he didn't like that. So Harry was born at the very, very, very beginning of February. He is an Aquarius man. Harry is not only the baby of One Direction, but he is also the baby of his household, which is just so fitting, I think. There's just something so real about that. He has one older sister named Gemma. Harry, Niall, and Liam were all the babies of their household, just like me. We are going to hold hands and dance in a circle about it. Oh, and by the way, Harry's 1D world of color is green. So we have Louis blue, Liam red, Zane yellow, Irish flag colors for Niall, and Harry is green. Harry loved singing when he was growing up. He would share stories about how he had this little karaoke machine that he would pull out and make songs on when he was growing up. He was also the lead singer of a band called White Eskimo when he was a teenager. Loved to perform, went to audition for The X Factor UK in 2010. Now, there you have it. Five scrawny European boys cross unlikely paths at a singing competition show in the ripe era of 2010. Did they all know each other prior? No. Where did they cross paths initially? Boot camp. 
All five of them went to different locations to audition for the X Factor as solo artists, and all of them made it to the boot camp round of the X Factor, which is the second round after auditions, if you're unfamiliar with the show. We know that all the boys met each other while they were at boot camp because if you watch the show, that's their season. You can see clips of them hanging around, playing music together, doing dances together on the stage during boot camp, all those things. So they hung around each other in that time before they became a band. There was a segment during boot camp also where Zayn did not want to dance and he was missing from the show and it was this big dramatic segment where they had to go find him. Zayn has been struggling with the choreography and as the rest of the boys get ready to perform, he's backstage refusing to take part. Basically, none of the boys made it past the boot camp round. And they were all sent out with the belief that they hadn't made it and they were going home. There's clips of them crying. Truly, now I wonder how much of this was fake. I don't know. But there was clips of them crying, feeling devastated that they got eliminated. However, all five of them were brought back on stage together and the judges told them that they would be going through as a boy band. All of this is framed as Simon Cowell's idea, but a lot of people actually credit Nicole Scherzinger for pitching the idea. After One Direction's formation, they took a little bit of time to go visit Harry's dad's bungalow so that they could bond with each other. What the fuck is a bungalow? I really, truly don't know. Please don't ask me. Some kind of house. But basically, they went to this bungalow to spend some time together and to practice their song, Torn, for when they would go to the judges' houses and perform it, which I think is a great idea. If you're going to be a new band together, I mean, shouldn't you go and spend some time together? You know, get to know each other before you start doing your damn thing. The bungalow story... Very much a big part of One Direction history. It's written into a lot of fan fictions and a lot of imaginings of what happened while they were there. Just a very classic thing. Very classic time. After their time at the bungalow, they moved on to the next round of the X Factor called the Judges' Houses. Their mentor was Simon because he was in charge of the groups that year. This is One Direction performing at the Judges' Houses. Don't they just look interesting. On this very day, Louis was stung by a sea urchin and had to go to the emergency room. It was made into this whole tragic segment, very much another big part of X Factor history when it comes to learning about One Direction. Louis got hurt, had to go to the emergency room, everyone was panicking, how are we going to sing without him? But he ended up being okay. He came back, made it to the performance, and they sang Torn. I forgot to show you this picture. This is them being formed on the X Factor. And this is them performing Torn at the judges' houses. Who decided to have a boy band sing Torn as their very first song together? I don't know, but that's just very interesting to me. And sometimes it makes me laugh. But yeah, Louis ended up being okay. He was their performance and they sang Torn. After they sang their Torn performance, they got a yes from the judges and made it through to the next round of the X Factor, which is very exciting, which means they would go on to live in the X Factor house and compete on the show every single week. Basically what would happen is every week there would be a theme, you pick a song to go with that theme, do a performance, and there would be an elimination all the way until week 10 when there would be three acts left and only one of them would go through and be the winner of the X Factor. So they were in the house for a whopping 10 weeks. The first performance they ever did together, we just talked about, it was a free performance. You could do whatever song you wanted. They did Torn. Week one's theme was number one singles and they sang Viva La Vida. Week two's theme was Heroes and they sang a song called My Life Would Suck Without You. Week three was Guilty Pleasures. They sang a song called Nobody Knows. Week four, Halloween. They did Total Eclipse of the Heart. Iconic, classic, never forget. Week five was American Anthems and they sang Kids in America. Week six was Elton John Week. They sang Something About the Way You Look Tonight. Week seven was The Beatles. They sang All You Need Is Love. Week eight, Rock. They did Summer of 69 and You Are So Beautiful. Week nine was the semifinal. One of the themes was Club Classics. They did a Rihanna song, Only Girl in the World. The other category was called Songs to Get You to the Final and they sang Chasing Cars. During the finale, they had a free choice and they sang a song called Your Song. Then they did celebrity duets that same week and they sang She's the One with Robbie Williams. One Direction ended up finishing third on The X Factor. The X Factor. They were third overall, which is kind of insane. But they did. They made it to third. And I think such a huge part of that was the overwhelming support that they had from the public, which we're going to talk about. These boys' time in the X Factor house from a marketing standpoint was really interesting. They had these very specific working brands for each of them that were sort of already falling into place while the boys were still in the X Factor house before they even broke out as a band. So let's go over some of One Direction's band roles. These are a key part of their career and their marketing, especially in the Up All Night era. So I just want to talk through them a little bit. So you have... Louis as this very class clown kind of guy, his brand ends up changing down the road. But in the beginning, he was this very, I'm like the guys in your hometown. I could be your boyfriend, sweet family man, goofy, classic, funny, class clown, sassy, prankster type of guy. Just like the fun and silly one who 
you would probably be neighbors with, you know? Then you had Liam, who was branded into the sensible one, the mom friend, except he's the dad, keeping everyone in check, very responsible. Daddy direction was what we called him. We were 13. We should look into that and figure out the implications and how that made us the way we are now. Zane was branded as cool and quiet and mysterious and full of himself. Very vain, pretty boy, kind of leather jacket, varsity jacket type of thing. Otherwise known as racism. You know. Then you had Niall, who was Irish. I mean, what they did with Niall was really interesting. They just made him into this very, like, I'm always single, bachelor pad, just wants to have fun, goofy Irish little idiot kind of thing. I don't say that as an insult. I say it because I mean it. They made him into the one that's just literally always laughing at everything. He thinks everything's so funny, he's so quirky and silly and perpetually single and never talks about relationships and he's Irish. That's literally what they did with Niall. Then you have Harry, who was obviously branded into the flirt, the charming one, the ladies' man. Just very cheeky, charming, ladies' man, flirty kind of guy. Also the front man of One Direction. All of these brands started to pop up while they were in the X Factor house doing various segments, but they would then go on to follow them into every single thing that they did, even now in their solo careers. Crazy how cemented these things were for these boys. But these roles did sort of work early on in the X Factor house. I was saying earlier that they had just an influx of public support so so many people were so in love with them before they even put out anything of their own while they were competing in the x factor house people were making stan accounts for them all over twitter mobbing the outside of the x factor waiting for them to even catch a glimpse to take pictures there would be people crawling all over the roof of the x factor house banging on walls trying to get in trying to look at them just absolute madhouse and they weren't off the show yet my theory is that simon knew that he wanted to sign them no matter what happened after he saw all of this hysteria coming because he's given interviews before about how he too was very shocked by all of this and he had never seen anyone in history do anything like it so i have a theory that he knew very early on that he wanted to sign them even if they lost the x factor they pretty much had everything cemented and set in stone just because of these little segments they were doing in the house that were drawing in this humongous fan base and it wasn't even just people supporting them on twitter it was like a whole culture of itself it was becoming a whole culture all kinds of inside jokes and sayings and interacting with the boys becoming a family it was all just so ever present right in the x factor era but yeah my thing here is just i think with this mass influx of public support and simon cow on their side these boys were good to go from the jump and this was sort of proven after they placed third on the x factor even though the boys didn't win they were offered a two million dollar recording contract with simon cowell under psycho records and being managed by modest management this is the psycho logo they were two million dollar recording contract with this very company right here and the boys took it for the record i did mention that they were being managed by modest this is psycho their record label but they also had a management team named modest management and i just want to note for the culture that the girlies hate modest management it was a whole thing growing up in the one direction fan to hate them because of the way that they mistreated one direction if you want more information on that i have a whole video called the dark side of one direction that you might have seen but you can check that out but i just thought since we're learning all about one Direction today, I should note that the girlies hate Modest, and one time there was even a fandom-wide attempt to buy One Direction out of their contracts and free them from their management when we were all like little 14-year-olds. After the boys signed this contract, they immediately went to LA to begin working on their debut album and signed a record deal with Columbia in the US. They were responsible for One Direction's American releases and such, and... Psycho was responsible for the UK ones. While the boys began work on their debut album, they were still associated and tied to the X Factor though, because when you go on the X Factor after the show is over, you would do an X Factor tour where basically you would tour around the UK and do shows performing your X Factor songs. And in this time when they were doing the X Factor tours, when the overwhelming support for them became even more abundantly clear, they had these humongous crowds at their shows, people waiting to meet them, bringing them all kinds of gifts. People would be making signs with all these inside jokes on them from the video diaries that they did while they were on the X Factor. While the boys were on the X Factor tour, they were staying really engaged with the public and with their fans. They had a lot of people constantly showing support for them and tweeting them, and they would be constantly tweeting fans, updating people on what they were doing, and making little videos for their YouTube channel, sort of documenting the behind the scenes process. I will say that's one thing they did really well really early on is staying super connected and engaged with the public. It's just really smart to keep the hype going in that way after you get out of the X Factor house so you can keep the support and momentum going for when they release their first single. 
In this time, the boys did write and release a book called Dare to Dream about their X Factor journey. And they were doing a bunch of book signings for it where these mass crowds of people would come with the books and get them signed. Literally huge, huge crowds of people. They also did a lot of documenting the book signings and uploading them on their YouTube channel, again, to keep people engaged. And while they were staying super engaged and doing all of these things to keep the momentum going with their audience, they were all over the place doing lots of work, not only book signings and live appearances, but they were also in different places working on their debut album. A lot of it was recorded in Sweden. Some of it was recorded in LA and the UK. So they were all over the map in this period of time. But they did stay super present and well-connected all leading up to the release of their very first single, What Makes You Beautiful. Oh, What Makes You Beautiful. And with What Makes You Beautiful, the Up All Night era is born out of the darkness. Let's talk a little bit about that. Like a lot of artists who have massive followings, you think of their career in what's called eras, just chunks of time where they have certain projects going on, usually an album and an accompanying tour. One Direction's different eras are a humongous part of their career and their brand as a band and what people remember them for who were here in the fandom. Like I said at the beginning of this video, this is all the Up All Night era and a little bit of the X Factor too. Each of One Direction's different eras were very specifically defined by different hairstyles and haircuts, style of clothing, inside jokes, lyrics, tours, all those different things that kind of come together and draw the lines between the eras. One Direction had five eras total, again, all beginning with Up All Night, even more specifically beginning with What Makes You Beautiful, their very first single. Yes, the song that had 2012 in a chokehold felt like a culture shift of its own an awakening, a moment. What Makes You Beautiful was written by a man named Savan who worked with One Direction for literally years and had a lot of involvement in a lot of their project. This is so funny, you guys, because What Makes You Beautiful was written by Savan after he heard his wife call herself ugly. So he wrote a song about it to make her feel better. I'm literally not making this up. Like you just can't make this stuff up. So Savan wrote this song about his wife's insecurities. He spent weeks tweaking and perfecting it. And then the band heard it and said, oh my God, this is perfect for us, basically. The boys recorded What Makes You Beautiful in Sweden, and then on August 10th in 2011, it was released. And on that same day when it was released to radio, they also released a lyric video for the song. After the debut of What Makes You Beautiful, they began releasing these teasers to count down to its music video. Again, kings of keeping people engaged. The teasers were basically a bunch of clips of them goofing off behind the scenes as they did in this time. And also just talking about the music video and the general setup of everything. Which then the music video was released about five days later on August 19th. And we got this beautiful creation. This music video is kind of iconic, but only because it's the first ever music video they ever did and literally nothing else. Except the fact that Louis got pulled over while filming for the music video because he was driving too slow. What Makes You Beautiful basically gave birth to the Up All Night era single-handedly and later went on to be their very first music video to ever hit a billion views years later. I remember that night. It was crazy. And now What Makes You Beautiful is also included in a lot of dusty old archives of 2010s hits and is included in a lot of those decade rewind mashups as well. It's just classic, you know? It became the most pre-ordered Sony Music Entertainment single in history and was the highest Billboard debut from any British act since 1998. I'm not done with the stats though. It was also the best-selling song by a boy band in digital history with almost 4 million copies sold and is still ranked as one of the best-selling songs of all time. So if that doesn't cement in your brain the impact, then I don't know what will. And all because Savan's wife was really insecure. I think it's very important that I mention that One Direction parodied their own song in this time and made a math version of it and it became a beloved inside joke. <laughs> what is wrong with this band? Anyways, their second single from Up All Night is called Gotta Be You. She's right here. This was released in November of 2011, and I gotta say, the music video is good if you're looking for a little laugh, a little hee-hee, if you will. They were coming for Oscars with this dramatic, love-struck, laddie boy fall aesthetic that they had going on in this music video. Gotta Be You charted really well at number three after its release. Not nearly as One Direction infection as What Makes You Beautiful, but still making waves. The other single is called One Thing, one of my personal favorite music videos. Just a very good music video for the One Direction fan culture as well. This music video featured the iconic in-betweeners dance that we had going on in this time period and no one will ever forget it or let it go. And the final single from Up All Night is called More Than This, which does not have an official music video, but they were in their heartbroken bag. So that's a little bit about the preparation leading up to the release of the Up All Night album and some of the singles. But now we need to look at the album as a whole and do a full look and review. So 
let's take a look at Up All Night. Hello and welcome to the portion of this video where we're going to review and talk about Up All Night. So I have the album right here with me. If you don't know, this is what the cover looks like. We've got all the boys looking great, it says Up All Night. Then on the back we have them running on the beach with a track list. Very interesting album cover choice for their debut. It's pretty safe I would say, they're all just there in a group on the cover doing their thing. It could be a little bit more interesting. I see how they're going with the What Makes You Beautiful vibe on the back running on the beach, but it's not very themed kind of just there, which makes a lot of sense, I guess, for a boy band's first album, you know? They don't really know who they are yet. They're just kind of throwing pop music out there. Now, this debut album was written entirely for the boys of One Direction. They don't have a single track on here that they wrote on because it was their first era as a boy band under a major record label. This is very much a pop album. Like, so pop, I can't even exaggerated enough. There wasn't really influences of anything else other than just pop and dance pop and various types of pop on this album. Nothing really rocky or anything like that. It's a pretty bubblegum album. Keep in mind this was their first album A and B released in the 2010s. So very like bubblegummy pop boy band cheesy type of album. I think some of my favorite songs on this album are definitely Tell Me A Lie, Everything About You, same mistakes stole my heart and i love moments it's on the extended edition of this i think some general fandom favorites on this album are same mistakes is pretty well loved i think tell me a lie is pretty well loved i want is a fun little classic <laughs> if you've heard this album you just get it okay i think this album now just serves as a really huge nostalgia factor a lot of people say they don't like up all night and i feel like if you were just a random person who was listening to it you'd be like because it's just so poppy and so cheesy, you know what I mean? So 2010. But it's a fun album for One Direction stands because it was their first ever album. At this point, it's just so fun and nostalgic. Brings back a lot of memories, especially of the time period when we were all really young. It's just fun. Like, Up All Night is for the bitches who know how to have a good time, and I stand by that. If you know how to have a good time, then you'll put on this album, and you'll bop to this album when it comes on. This album was actually well-received by critics at the time when it came out, and it was described by critics as perfectly targeted, which is so incredibly true. It topped the charts in 16 countries and was 2012's third best-selling album in any genre. Which is kind of crazy because, again, it was just their debut album and it was already so popular. This album also put One Direction in the Guinness Book of World Records for being the first UK group in chart history to debut at number one with their first album. I also think that the marketing and promotion of this album was pretty solid for a few reasons. We talked about how engaged One Direction stayed all throughout this era especially, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in this video. The reason I say the marketing and promo was so interesting though is because their marketing team gave interviews about this album saying that they devised a strategy to promote it with social media and fans rather than doing big heavy radio pushes. It just makes so much sense. I've been talking non-stop about how the Up All Night era was so just about growing into a fan base alongside social media. So the fact that their marketing team took that and made a strategy out of, out of it to promote the album, crazy. And it worked. But yeah, pop bubblegum nostalgia right here on this album. Very fun, very campy. Did really, really well on the charts. Was so heavily promoted by fans. This is truly just a period piece and something that's gonna be deeply ingrained into the memories of millions. December after Up All Night came out is when the boys began to tour it. The initial dates were just for the UK and Ireland, but eventually they spread them out to Oceania and North America. They had 54 shows total and even recorded one of them for their DVD called Up All Night, The Live Tour, with footage of them performing. I very vividly remember this video. I used to cry in my basement to it. Oh my gosh, the memories I have of sobbing my eyes out listening to them perform live and then my dad coming downstairs and being like, what's going on here? During this tour, they also had a band, like an instrument band on tour with them that the fandom would then get familiar with. I so graciously included a picture of the band on this wall. This picture is not from the Up All Night tour, but it is a picture of all of them with the band. Their band members are John, Dan, Sandy, and Josh, all pictured right here. Great instrument players. I should also introduce you while we're here to this guy, Paul Higgins. This is One Direction's tour manager and part-time bodyguard. This guy is a huge part of One Direction's Stan culture. Not for any particular reason other than the fact that he was just always there. 
In the roughest of times, Paul was there. So, big part of the history. You should just know who this man is. So the Up All Night tour really solidified these looks that were ingrained into people's brains for the Up All Night era because of what they were each wearing. It became like their thing. It became their staple. You have Louis in stripes, Niall in a polo, Harry in some kind of blazer, Liam in a plaid shirt, and Zane in a varsity jacket. These were the staples, the look. Anything outside of this on stage would be absolutely criminal to a One Direction fan in 2012. These outfits are like the face of Up All Night, just this right here. Let's go through some other Up All Night classics other than these outfits. You have carrots via Louis saying in a video diary that he likes girls who eat them. Grave mistake. You have spoons via Liam saying that he is afraid of them. Grave mistake. You have cats via Harry getting caught on live TV saying pussy and then trying to fix it by saying he meant cats. Bow ties, due to the outfit changes that they did on the Up All Night tour. Part of the time they were in these uniforms, part of the time they were in these like fancy get up outfits, so. This video called The Adventurous Adventures of One Direction that was animated and created by Mark Parsons and became a huge hit in the fandom. The creator even got to meet the boys who watched this cartoon. If you're a One Direction fan and you haven't seen this, that's terrible and you should get on that. The Up All Night Tour Diaries, there's four of them. There are videos where the boys sit together and goof off and answer a bunch of questions like they did in the X Factor house. These game show segments called Spin the Harry and Megamind, very big part of One Direction Up All Night culture and history. Twit cams, which are basically live streams that the boys did on Twitter all the time in this time. They're dolls because they got these dolls released this early in their career. Mine are still in the box because I want to take care of them. This episode of iCarly that the boys were on to do promo in the States when they were getting bigger here. They spent a whole week on Nickelodeon and did a prank segment in that time. That's also a huge part of the Up All Night era. And also going on tour with Big Time Rush, around the winter time of 2012 when they were already on their own tour. Like I said, this whole period of time was just a lot of being super interactive with fans and just really solidifying this thing that was so uniquely them. They were really trying to be not like other boy bands and they just wanted to be a fun and goofy best friend type of boy band and they really pulled it off in this time. It really just is a look at One Direction growing into popularity right alongside of social media and a bunch of stan culture things that were born off of social media and they really managed to take that and make it into this airtight One Direction universe. And it really did work. They were charting really high, doing really well in their first era. They won their first ever Brit in February of 2012, which is a huge moment. They also performed at the KCAs in this time and won their very first KCA. They went on the Today Show. They went on SNL. They won two VMAs and performed at the Olympics, the 2012 Olympics. And it's crazy that all of this stuff was going on because they were already recording their second album while all this stuff was going on later down the road. So they were doing the madness of Up All Night promo touring up all night and recording their second album all at the same time. Not only that, but in between, they were hosting twit cams and doing all these appearances, attending events, all while recording a whole ass album and being on tour, which unfortunately becomes really common for them and fans would start to notice and protest the workload. But it is insane that all of this stuff happened within their first era of being a band together only within the span of like a year after getting off of the X Factor. And it only got crazier as they went into their second project. Now, the very first single from our next One Direction era adventure was called Live While We're Young, right here. This is all going down in the fall time of 2012. Live While We're Young was also written on by Savan. Remember the guy who wrote What Makes You Beautiful about his ugly wife? Yes, Savan. Live While We're Young was received really positively by critics and topped the charts in 15 different countries. It was the fastest pre-order single in history at the time and broke the record for that. Evidently, a lot of new people came along in this time and loved One Direction and were anticipating their second project. The only negative thing we're working with here for Live While We're Young is the fact that for the first time in their career, a bunch of parents were really upset and disapproved of Live While We're Young because of its sexual nature in lyrics, which I just think is really funny. Like, I guess Tonight Let's Get Some was just too much for some people. The music video for Live While We're Young got leaked, so their team released it four days before they originally were supposed to. Also, the music video was a little bit different from the theming that we had going on Up All Night. It's a little bit more grown up, kind of like what I was saying with the Tonight Let's Get Some lyric and people being upset. You know, they were a bunch of bros partying, 
dancing the night away, let's get some making memories, that kind of vibe for the music video. And here is where I would like to take a moment to reintroduce you to the members of One Direction, but now with their Take Me Home era looks. So we have Louis here, who looks a little bit different than he did in our last era, rocking the quiff. This was definitely the time for it. Quiff direction, I should say. He's got some facial hair going on. He wore his hair up in the little quiff. Everything is great. Liam, and this time we had bald Liam. He shaved his head and got a buzz cut in this period of time. Very noteworthy, very memorable. It's just the face of the Take Me Home era is pretty much Liam being bald, so. Then you have Zayn with the blonde stripe in his hair, courtesy of Perry Edwards' mother who dyed it for him. He was wa rocking that vanilla stripe in his hair in this time. Again, the face of the Take Me Home era. Then you have Harry down here. Not much of a difference between Up All Night Harry. He just has shorter curls this time. They were long and crazy in the first era, but now they're a little bit tamed and shorter. He's looking good, looking great, always looking great. And then you have Quiff Nile, who joined Louis and Zayn in the Quiff Direction direction. They are all facing the same way with the Quiffs. And this is Take Me Home One Direction for you. The other two singles on this album are Kiss You and Little Things, both period pieces in One Direction history. The Kiss You music video is pretty fun because they do their silly little dance moves in it. It's very random and all over the place. Lots of different costume changes in this one. And the behind the scenes is fun because you see Niall hitting himself in the eye with a sun visor in it. Little Things was a wildly exciting time for One Direction stance in this time because it was written for them by Ed Sheeran. And in this period of time, Ed Sheeran was hot and poppin' and the girlies loved the crossover between them and One Direction. The album for this era, Take Me Home, came out on November 9th, only three months after Live While We're Young dropped. So they basically barely just finished up all night and zoomed into their next era with no type of pause, which again is very common for them, unfortunately like I said earlier, but let's take a little moment to look at and review and talk about Take Me Home. Hello, welcome back to album discussions. This time we're gonna be looking at Take Me Home. So this is the Take Me Home album cover. We have all the boys on top of a phone booth featuring Niall's little self inside of the phone booth looking up. I always thought that this album cover was a little unfortunate because you can't really see Niall. He's just like in there on the phone very tinily and if you didn't know he was there, you might miss him. And this album cover, they're all dressed in similar outfits. On the Up All Night cover, they were wearing just like random outfits, but this one, they all have some kind of like black and white dressy attire. Zane's got the fedora going on, Harry has a bow tie on, Liam's got the black vest and the white shirt. Can't even tell what Niall's wearing inside that little phone booth, but I'm sure it's on theme. I don't really know what to say in terms of the theming of the album cover as it relates to the album. I would say that it's very like, okay, the album is called Take Me Home and they're like in a phone booth and that's pretty, and that's pretty common in like UK culture, like the phone booth thing. Like here in America, if you have anything that's themed after the UK, it's gonna have a phone booth. Um, so maybe that, but honestly, I don't know. It's just a fun little cover with all of them on it. The back is pretty basic. It just has the track list and like some shooting star graphics and then the inside is pretty similar to the inside of Take Me Home. I mean, Up All Night. They both have red CDs inside. I don't think I opened Up All Night for you, but it looks just like this. Yeah. So in terms of being cohesive, I give this an F because the track listing and the front of the album don't really have anything in common and it's very random. But anyways, moving on from reviewing the album cover. Just like Up All Night, Take Me Home has a track list that was written entirely by other people and given to One Direction to perform, so they still have yet to write their own songs on their album. This one is similarly very poppy and bubblegum poppy, kind of like Up All Night, but I will say it's a very different album. They do have a similar feel in terms of being, you know, a 2010s album by a boy band that's like bubblegummy, but this one isn't as like bubblegum pop as up all night. Up all night is like, I'm going to One Direction club night and this is gonna be banging in there because it's such a bubblegum poppy 2010 song. This one is a little bit more experimental with rock. There's more like rocky guitar-y sounds on this album. And it is a little bit more mature, like one step up from Up All Night in terms of being a more mature album. Not the most mature they've ever gotten, obviously, but just like one step up. It's not as teenage bubblegum boy bandy type of thing. And there are some solid bangers on Take Me Home. I think some fandom favorites are Come On, Come On, Over Again, for sure, like number one fandom favorite on this album and one of my favorite songs of One Direction's in general off of all of their albums. So that says something about this album. I think I Would is a good one. 
Um, lots of love for Rock Me. There's just some pretty solid hits on this one. This one is really fun, just like Up All Night. It's really fun, but just again, one half step up from the last one. So this album was mostly recorded in Sweden and our good old friend Svan helped write a lot of it. He actually said he spent six months in Sweden developing the album for the boys, which is crazy. But fun fact about the writing, we were talking about how these songs were given to the boys and they didn't write them themselves again. Simon Cowell, moment of silence, actually saw the success of how Up All Night did and decided to make the writing process for Take Me Home competitive. He basically had a bunch of prominent writers in the industry compete for a spot on this album because everyone in the industry knew that Up All Night was a hit. It performed super well in the charts. It sold so many copies. So everyone was kind of fighting for their lives to get one of their songs on Take Me Home. One of the competing writers, D, said, breaking a boy band in the US is about as big as it gets in the music industry. So you can imagine the competition to get cuts on the next One Direction album is immense. That's what I was just thinking about because the writers in the industry, if you don't know, get a cut of the revenue made off of the songs they write. So I'm sure a lot of people were fighting tooth and nail to make sure that one of their songs was on this album. And the anticipation of these writers was correct because Take Me Home topped the charts in 35 countries, which is a huge step up from the success of Up All Night, even though Up All Night was very successful for a debut album. And The Boys broke another record for this album. It debuted at number one on the Billboard 200 making One Direction the first group to debut two albums at number one since 2008. So they were on their way to superstardom beyond belief. All the faith that people had in them from Up All Night really did carry over to Take Me Home and it just performed super super well. I think they did a really good job in the Up All Night era of like attracting a bunch of fans like we talked about earlier and getting people on board. So then by the time they were working on their second project they had this cult following already thanks to the internet and a lot of people were anticipating another one because they had so many more fans in so many other countries. So Take Me Home was just bound to take off and she did. In December of 2012, after the boys were releasing singles, they played Madison Square Garden for the very first time, which was a huge move career-wise and a huge accomplishment. There was lots of famous people in attendance at this show who wanted to see them perform, including Ed Sheeran, who came on for a surprise performance of Little Things. Also during this era, we have Harry here doing his iconic MSG pose that he gave birth to this year in 2012. When they went to MSG for the first time, he posted a picture of himself like this with his arms out in front of the Jumbotron and then went on to do that every time he played MSG to this day. What a walk down memory lane, where it all began. Around their MSG performance in 2012 is when there was this anonymous figure tormenting and taunting the One Direction fandom online. I wish I was joking. This anonymous figure called themselves Mr. X and they posted a series of really scary and cryptic riddles and poems online that were scaring people into thinking that they were going to harm the boys. It was a wild time. Everyone was really terrified and it was such a big fandom wide thing that even Simon Cowell himself chimed in to ask who the hell is Mr. X? So it got pretty big. It got pretty outrageous. Obviously nothing dangerous end up going down. I I was gonna say I recommend looking into Mr. X, but do I? I don't know if I do. After the boys played Madison Square Garden, they stayed in New York to record some footage for their charity single called One Way or Another. This is the music video for One Way or Another. Bits of it were filmed in New York. Bits of it were filmed in Africa when they were there doing charity work. I think One Way or Another became a huge staple of the Take Me Home era because the boys did it themselves. It was a charity single. They filmed the music video themselves for the charity and it was just a fun little silly thing. They did a lot of their dance moves in that music video too. So it's just a really well-known part of the Take Me Home era and the things that they did in that time. The single was for a charity called Comic Relief in support of Red Nose Day, which rolled around in March of 2013 and the boys did a performance for it. This is when Louis actually dyed his hair red in support of the cause and a lot of people wanted him to feel appreciated and know that we saw it and liked it. So. We Noticed Your Hair Louie was trending number one worldwide on that day for him. A little bit later in April, the boys filmed a commercial for this perfume called Our Moment, which was their very first official perfume. Our Moment, sorry for my overuse of the word iconic, but Our Moment was pretty iconic. Obviously, it's their very own perfume, like their sleigh. They were really doing every single thing that they could. I still have the Our Moment perfume, as I'm sure a lot of people do. Then May rolls around and the boys announce via press conference that they're going on a stadium tour in 2014 called Where We Are. This was while they were in the middle of touring Take Me Home. So the fact that they announced their next tour already without even having an album is just absolutely insane. But... More on the Where We Are tour in a little bit. Another huge promo thing that the boys did in this time for the album is this iconic Pepsi commercial that the boys filmed in New Orleans with football star Drew Brees. It came on TV 
all the time in this time period, and a lot of people, like me, have it memorized word for word, because we are insufferable. Come on, kid, I'm Drew Brees. And I'm Harry. Around this time, the boys were doing a lot of magazine shoots as well. They did one for British Vogue, Fabulous, and Cosmopolitan. Great magazines, bookshelf faves. And they also performed for and met the Queen. So promo-wise, they also did a partnership with Nabisco in this time. I hope I'm saying that right. But this prompted a bunch of videos of them doing little interviews and stuff, including this one that was really well known because they were having a debate over whether or not the cream or the cookie is better in an Oreo. Say cookie. Say cookie. I won't. Without the cream, you can't make I won't a be a friend. shake, though. Cookie. Say cookie. Cookie. I've gone for cream. I've gone for cream. I'm sorry. Kind of crazy what becomes an inside joke around here. But speaking of being in on something, around this time, the boys also got matching screw tattoos to solidify their lifelong bond. I don't know. All of them but Niall got matching screw tattoos because Niall doesn't have any tattoos, so he didn't get one. But the rest of them have screwed. Now, in the meantime, while all of this was going on, back in February, rewinding a little bit, was when the boys kicked off their Take Me Home tour in London, and they would be on the Take Me Home tour for nine months. Girl, girl. There was four legs of this tour with about 123 shows, which is why it took nine months to complete with breaks in between. Definitely a huge step up from the Up All Night tour in terms of capacity and amount of shows. And plus the Take Me Home tour was a lot less intimate than the Up All Night tour. It was a lot bigger, huge production, big stage with huge screens with all these effects and lights and literally the works. It was just so much bigger than Up All Night. The outfits this time on their tour were not branded to each individual guy like they were so heavily in the Up All Night era. This time they opted for kind of a group theme of these very American looking outfits. Lots of denim, band t-shirts, bandana, jerseys eventually, baggy jeans, big shoes, that kind of thing. Other staples of the Take Me Home era include the One Direction Girlfriend Squad, made up of Perry Edwards, Danielle Pizer, and Eleanor Calder, who were dating Zane, Liam, and Louie. They were a huge staple of the time period. This picture will go down in the archives of history and will be studied years and years from now because of the grip it had on society. Just now realizing that I forgot to print out a second picture of the adventurous adventures of One Direction to show you, like I just went to point at it and it's simply not there. So I'll put it on the screen. But another staple of the Take Me Home era is the second installment of the Adventurous Avengers of One Direction. We talked about the first one in the Up All Night era. Well, Mark Parsons released a second one. Also a staple of the Take Me Home era was the beef that One Direction had with competing boy band The Wanted. They were tweeting each other and fighting publicly online all the time. Mainly Louis was at the forefront of these fights. This good old man. Really just taking one for the team and fighting the wanted. But Zane also got into a fight with the wanted on Twitter. He actually started the fight and then Louis jumped in. And then there was also a part where Liam jumped in and had something to say too. But they were just always beefing, talking about each other in interviews, talking about each other on stage. The girlies were just fighting and it was a thing and the fandom hated the wanted fandom. It was just a proper duel. It was a proper rivalry. These Madame Tussauds wax figures that the boys got in this time, um, they're very laughable to look at. I don't know what the fuck happened to Liam's face, but they did get wax figures, kind of a you made it moment. So good for them, good for them. And then also another staple this time are these One Direction World stores. Some of them were pop-up stores in random locations, but there was actually proper like big One Direction World stores in London and New York. Basically the 1D World stores were just giant stores filled to the brim with every type of One Direction merch imaginable. Cardboard cutouts, backpacks, posters, socks, their dolls, just all stacked up and it was completely decked out in One Direction stuff. My villain origin story is never getting to go to one. In this period of time, the boys won a second Brit Award, Billboard Music Awards, People's Choice Award, Teen Choice Award, and an MTV Award. So they were just checking every box, lots of accomplishments. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the first break segment that we have of this One Direction deep dive video. I was really inspired by Quentin Reviews, kind of like I said at the beginning of this video, to do little commercial break segments in between talking about One Direction's career, just to keep things exciting and fresh and so nobody gets too bored just watching an entire timeline. So welcome to your first 
commercial break. For this commercial break, we're going to be taking a look at One Direction moments that live in my head rent free. I wanted to make this a full length YouTube video at one point, but I thought it would be much better to just stick it in here because it's so fitting and it matches what we're talking about. So I have this long list that I've been adding to over time of the randomest moments and happenings and things that have happened on video that I am just, these are just things that scratch an itch in my brain. For some reason, they're so addicting. I could watch them all day and they all have to do with One Direction. So essentially this is me opening up the doorway and letting you into my world, into my brain, into the things that drive me insane. The rhyme. Oh god, I'm so annoying. Okay, the first One Direction moment that lives in my head rent-free is when Niall Horan went on Jimmy Fallon and did a bunch of accent impressions. It was the night before Christmas when all through the house stockings were hung by the chimney with care. The children were very, very happy. <laughs> And mom and her kerchief and I and my cap. When uh, out of the roof, there was such a clatter. He was phenomenal. I was gonna say phenomenal, but that reminds me of phenomenal. Okay. He was just so good at doing these accent impressions. He absolutely ate it up and left not a single crumb. So this is the one that scratches the itch the deepest and darkest. This high note that Liam did when he was singing Best Song Ever Live. The next one is this highlight reel of Louis's really, really thick accent and nobody can understand a thing that he's saying and it's so funny. Um, but, um, quick fire. Nerve wracking. What? Party. Cinema. Me, exes. Five years. I'm a singer. Stuffed goose. Twitter. In Europe, right? Rubbish. Tattoo. Whatever. Um, pop. Yeah, yeah, give me a break. I don't know why that one is so addicting, but it's just like his voice. Going back to the live vocals, so many things on this list are just live vocals. This clip of Harry singing Last First Kiss live. I can never stop thinking about it. Not a day in my life do I not sit here and ponder. Harry saying, if I would stay, like, Especially when you play the audio as like an empty arena audio. Those empty arena audios are so addicting. They used to be really, really popular where it would be like just the song with nothing, no screaming, no backing vocals, but it's kind of echoey. Empty arena. Another one of my favorite live vocals is when Niall took over Zayn's high note. Spoiler alert, after the band became four, they had to redistribute the solo so that they could still sing through their songs. And they gave Niall one of them. It just, oh my goodness, it's so heavenly. I could sit here and watch it over and over again all day long. Also, the Spaces Harmony Live. When will we love? San Diego. No. Spaces between. Yep. Absolutely. It just sounds so clean and full and together and the way that the music like fades out at that point where they go, oh, space. It's just so good. I'm pretty sure the spaces harmony live is what you hear when you reach the gates of heaven. I was writing all these down in my notes just so I could like follow along and like put them in this video. One of the notes that I wrote down just says, bruh, the Macarena fan cam. <laughs> If you've been on One Direction Stan Twitter in the past like two or three years, you've probably seen this Macarena fan cam. It's something, there's something so addicting about it. The music, the flow of it. This one is a really good one. The reggae version of Last First Kiss. A lot of fans like know this one and like sing it as an alternate version of Last First Kiss, even though it's like really short. Also, this one time when they were performing live, they sang Beautiful Girls by Sean Kingston, and especially Niall. Like, oh, there's just something about the way that they're singing this cover. Kinda need that to be a continuous thing. Kinda need that to be a staple. It's just so perfect. This is just literally like maybe 10 minutes of me just sitting here being like, 
and deserved, whatever. Oh my God, this dance monologue thing that Harry did on Jimmy Fallon. I think about this once a week. I swear to God, I think about this once a week. It's so catchy. The way that he's like moving, like bopping. Oh my God, addicting. There's crack in that video, I don't care. Whatever the hell this is. Look who's texting me. No. I'm a bad man, what's my name? Nile. Pulling out this little bird, this is my name, Nile. I really couldn't tell you, but it lives in my brain absolutely rent-free. She's not paying a coin to live there. Harry performing with Stormzy and saying, fuck the government, fuck Boris. I can never down Chuck Norris. I very vividly remember when that first happened and I saw it I collapsed onto the ground and started rolling around on my carpet laughing and like screaming because I couldn't believe that he said that I mean I know it's the lyric but the way that he gave Harry that lyric and he was like fuck the government Ah! This moment in the video diary where Zayn started singing I want to live forever I don't even know what the song is called But I think about this a lot and I quote it a lot Um, the Megamind video where Louis says, refrigerator. If I was to look in your refrigerator, refrigerator, fridge, what would I find? Also another thing that I quote so much. This dance that they did on camera during an interview one time that, oh my God, this one's like up all night. I don't, I'm surprised I didn't talk about this when I did the up all night era. Oh, oh you're doing this one. Oh, Oh, here we go. Give it some, yeah. Arms down. Here yeah. we go. Arms down. Yeah. Bring Whoa. it low. Low. No, you've low, missed it out, low, bro. Low, low, low. Bring it back up for the head. Oh, 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 oh. Stop. But this is a staple. That damn dance. Oh my god, that video where Niall's performing 18 and then someone in the audience goes, What the fuck is a chance? Classic, classic, iconic. This vine someone did like impersonating Liam when he's performing Little Thanks. She was so right for that because why does he do that? And he really does do that. It could be like the slowest song known to man and my man is over here like hitting the Will Schuster moves. Thank you for watching and listening to some of my favorite random One Direction moments and live vocals. This commercial break has been completed and I'll see you again soon for another one. Back to the timeline. So while One Direction was still on the Take Me Home tour, they started promo for their next album single called Best Song Ever. Best Song Ever released in July of 2013 and actually landed at number two on the Billboard charts, which then officially made Best Song Ever their highest charting US single so far in their eras. The accompanying best song ever music video actually was shot in the beginning movie style and each of the boys had a different character that they were playing. Each boy in their character role had a short video featured introducing them serving as a countdown to the music video. So like it would be five days, one character, four days, meet the other character, three days, and so on. Up here we have the best song ever music video characters. This is Harry as Marcel, Liam as Leroy, Zayn as the beautiful Veronica Malik, and these roles are Harry as the marketing guy, Liam as a choreographer, Veronica as the assistant, and then Louie and Niall's characters were like studio execs and they just look absolutely ridiculous but they did this whole opening monologue, they did this whole scene where they were acting before the music video like kicked in and started and it's just an iconic piece of One Direction history. A lot of people have that opening monologue completely memorized. I have it completely memorized and there's also like a long copy pasta of it in my notes because I used to send it to my friends as emails to like prank them. Haha, ha, I don't I don't know. But yeah, that portion of the music video, they were in character. And then the second portion is like them wrecking the office of the execs that they're in. And it's like a whole dance number. The dance number at the end of the best song ever music video is also pretty iconic to One Direction stand. It was going around as a TikTok trend for a while where people were recreating the dance. And a few times that I've been in line to see people at concerts, people will play best song ever and like be doing the dance in line. It's just like a thing, you know, the best song ever ending dance thing. This music video, best song ever, actually also served as a promo for their upcoming documentary movie. 
This Is Us. This movie, This Is Us, released only a month after Best Song Ever and grossed over $68 million worldwide. Bitches were seated for the This Is Us movie. Everyone was in attendance. The documentary movie, This Is Us, is basically a film that follows the boys while they're on tour, kind of giving you a look into their careers and what they do day to day, talking with some of their family members. And then there's clips of them like performing live in between so you could see live shots from the Take Me Home tour. In my theater, when I saw This Is Us, every time I saw This Is Us, people were singing out loud to the concert clips, so that was really fun. Big, big, big classic in the fandom. I remember when they put This Is Us on Netflix and everyone went crazy, so staple. In this time, the boys were doing a ton of promo for This Is Us, including this well-known promo with Zoella. That is the YouTuber Zoella doing the Chubby Bunny Challenge with One Direction. Truly a time to be alive when One Direction was thriving, releasing a movie, and YouTubers like Zoella were extremely popular doing challenges on YouTube. No, like, time to be alive, if only you were there. Right after the premiere of This Is Us, we learned that Zayn and Perry are engaged to each other, which was a huge, shocking pop culture breaking news moment back in its time. Chaos and madness. I remember she showed up to that premiere with a rock on her hand, and everybody was like, all right, okay. Shortly after the movie premiere of This Is Us, the boys won another VMA award and another Teen Choice Award. Please let it be known that this is the period of time where Harry was twerking at the Teen Choice Award and then proceeded to peel and eat an orange that he found behind Rihanna. Again, you just had to be there. In October, the boys went to Australia in this time to do their shows over in Oceania for the Take Me Home tour. While they were there, these two fans broke into Liam's hotel room and stole the boxers that were hanging outside to dry and then later got caught on the beach by security wearing them under her skirt and was instructed to take them off and give them back. Did you really need to know that piece of information going over One Direction's career? No. But I just thought it'd be a fun little tidbit to remind everyone because that happened. Also in October, the boys released their second single from this era called Story My Life. And its accompanying music video featured their family members and lots of photos and memories of them. You know, story of my life. So I thought that was a really cute concept. They had all their families involved, like I said. And it was very collaborative and very homey and sweet. One of my favorite music videos and a really strong single choice. This was also the first time they released a single that they had written on themselves, which is so incredibly insane and says a lot because if you think about the singles that they were releasing before like kiss you live while we're young one thing and then story of my life it stands out so much so that says a lot about them as songwriters aka they're great songwriters story of my life did reach number one in a few different countries as well it charted really well a few weeks after the release of story of my life one direction's new album called midnight memories leaked in its entirety early so let's talk about the midnight memories album welcome back to looking at one direction's albums with me your host Today we're looking at Midnight Memories. So here we have the album cover for Midnight Memories. I really, really love this one. This is the back, the boys just like holding up the album track list. I think out of all of their albums so far that we've looked at, this one definitely looks the most cohesive. The album cover and the title and the back of the album all really match, like knowing what the vibe of Midnight Memories is. This album cover is kind of perfect. It looks really good. Um, it includes their logo in a way that matches really well. It just looks so them in the time period and then just them holding up the album on the back. Like it just out of the three that they've released so far in our little timeline, this one is definitely the most cohesive looking and it makes the most sense. And just like the way it has a little banner down here that says Midnight Memories is kind of similar to them holding it up on the back and kind of similar to the One Direction being on a banner on the front. It just looks it just looks good. Very cohesive cover and packaging, one of my faves. The track list for this album was actually revealed little by little on Twitter through an interactive social media campaign that the boys did, where basically you would be given hints and you had to fill in the blanks and then the track list formed like that, just like through Twitter, which is really cool. I like it when artists come up with ways to make things interactive when they're doing projects. It's really good for engagement and fan artist relationships. I'd say this album is definitely a fandom favorite. This one is highly favored, like statistically, and it's also my my favorite One Direction album, so bragging a little bit, biased a little bit, but it is a really well-loved album around the fandom. This was the first album that the boys had songs on it that they wrote themselves and it was not all just given to them like their previous project. And you can really tell if you listen to their discography, the jump from Up All Night, Take Me Home to Midnight Memories is so drastic. It's just a million steps up from Take Me Home, which again is insane because they recorded these projects so little next to each other. But Midnight Memories is so mature, it has a very rock-oriented sound. 
Um, it's definitely nothing like the bubblegum pop stuff that they were doing on Up All Night and the very poppy dance poppy stuff they were doing on Take Me Home as well. This is the first album that kind of came along and introduced a brand new sound with such different sounding songs and I think that was really well received. A lot of this album was written by Louis himself, the man, the myth, the legend, Louis Tomlinson. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's so good. He's so talented. He did great with a lot of the stuff on here. I'd say some of the strongest tracks on this album, Midnight Memories, story my life strong happily right now through the dark better than words little white lies oh my god half the fucking album is favored by the fandom this has some really strong tracks on it this album was just so much different than the other ones that we've looked at not only in terms of like style and music but the way that it was received by the public as well like this album became a huge trending thing on tumblr um because we were kind of in that 2014 ish like soft grunge era where people had like vinyls and like this album with heavily filtered like filters on it was always featured on tumblr and like in an aesthetic way you know like the jean jackets adidas black and white plants american apparel era this is one of the albums that the girls were raving over just in a way that's so different from how the other albums were received um this one was just so much more mature and was kind of growing up with the fandom and growing up with the boys and exploring their songwriting. This album debuted at number one on the Billboard 200 and that made One Direction the first group in history to debut all three of their first three albums at number one on the charts, which is a crazy record to have. They just kept making number one albums. This album was also highly praised by critics in a way that's kind of different if you read reviews to how Up All Night and Take Me Home were received and praised by critics. It was just a really well-loved album among music critics and the public, which is so deserved because this is one of their strongest releases of all times and I stand by that. Cheers to Midnight Memories. On November 23rd, before the release of Midnight Memories, the boys held a seven hour long live stream called 1D Day. This is one of the most insane things I've ever seen them do. I still can't believe to this day that this happened. But basically, like I said, it was a seven hour continuously running, no cuts, live stream where the boys did a series of different challenges and games and interviews and answering questions, interacting with fans, showcasing fan projects, all kinds of different things stuffed into this seven hour long live stream that lasted all day and supported the Midnight Memories album. During this live stream, they also invited some fans to come into a phone booth and listen to Midnight Memories early, but there was like this giant elephant in the room because everyone knew that the album leaked and those girlies had probably already heard it, but nobody was addressing the leaks at all. And so now it's like this running joke, those girlies in the phone booth pretending to listen to Midnight Memories for the first time. But yeah, 1D Day was definitely a staple of the Midnight Memories era. So much fun. Just a very creative promo idea, very interactive and fun. Got people involved. It was trending all over Twitter. Peace and blessings to 1D Day. During 1D Day, we got this Lilac Nile. He dyed his hair during 1D Day and it was this like soft purpley color in his little blonde hair. We also got a Talk Dirty To Me music video, which was very random, but very much appreciated now. One of the most satisfying things to watch for some reason, just them dancing around, goofing off like idiots to Talk Dirty To Me. It really just is a symbol of the time period, I think. One D-Day, that is just history. This will be in the books, aka this video about One Direction history. The boys went to the Brits in this time again and brought home two awards this time. They also won a VMA, an American Music Award, a Billboard Music Award, and Teen Choice Awards all in the Midnight Memories era for this album and their singles. Some other staples that I have for you going on in this time period. Crazy Mofos Nile. Um, in this time period, that's what he would call the fan base, Crazy Mofos, which is, I, I don't know. Had it on a shirt. He actually had it on two shirts. It was this one, and then he had another one that was in like cursive loopy kind of font that also said Crazy Mofos. We also had Vine Star Harry. He was very active on Vine in this time period. Everyone bow your heads and say your condolences because we lost her. He is not active on social media anymore, but he was. We also have these MNG photos that we always got in this time period. Meet and greet if you don't know, against this black background with all the boys looking like the frat bros that they were in this uh, time period. There's all kinds of different strange M and G poses. I think we need to study that period of time and that phenomenon. People would ask the boys to like propose in these M and G photos, get on each other's backs, kiss cheeks and hold hands and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> it's just so iconic. I look at this black background and I'm like, man, what a time to be alive. We also have Cinnamon Swirl Louie. 
This is very important to me. That's why I included it on this board. It happened in this time period. They styled his hair up in this little swirly, and now the fandom calls it the cinnamon swirl. Um, I deeply appreciate this hairstyle, and it's uh, another thing that you can give your condolences to because I very highly doubt it's ever going to come back, but he just looked spectacular. <laughs> And then another staple of this time period is the One Direction X Five Seconds of Summer Friendship. Real ones know, real ones remember. Five Sauce was on tour with One Direction in this time and they had such a cute friendship. They would always be tweeting at each other, tweeting about each other, hanging out, playing soccer or football, taking pictures together. Niall hung out with a lot of them a lot. That's one of the things that the girlies are going to be like, I was born in the wrong generation. I needed to be alive when this was a thing. Welcome back to Commercial Breaks with me, your host for every single segment of this video. That's either a great thing or a horrible thing. For this Commercial break segment, we are going to be testing your knowledge about One Direction to see if you've been paying attention throughout this video. I'm going to be asking you some trivia questions you guys at home are going to answer. I'll tell you the question's answer and you'll be able to see if you got it right or not. No pressure because nobody's watching but you, but maybe some pressure just for you and yourself. Let's get into it. You'll have 10 seconds to answer each question. I would give you more time, but I don't want us to sit in silence for more than 10 seconds. <laughs> question number one. What year did One Direction form on the X Factor? <music> 2010. Like we discussed in the beginning of this video, did you remember? What's the name of One Direction's third official single? The answer is one thing, one of my favorite One Direction singles, especially off of Up All Night. When is Niall's birthday? The answer is September 13th. Did you get that? What song did One Direction perform at the judges' house's round of The X Factor? The answer is Torn. Ah, memories. They also covered Torn in 2015, which is very, very deeply upsetting. Which member of One Direction was born on February 1st in 1994? The answer is Harry. Next question. In 10 seconds, give me all five middle names of the One Direction boys. It's James, James, Edward, William, and Javad. How did you do? <laughs> What's the name of the man that I told you wrote One Direction's first single for them? Savan, remember, with the insecure wife. Absolutely. What's the name of One Direction's very first book that we talked about early on in this video? Dare to Dream. What month did One Direction release their documentary film, This Is Us? August. August of 2013. August 29th, Liam's birthday, to be more specific. Where did I tell you that most of One Direction's Take Me Home album was recorded? Sweden. It was mostly recorded in Sweden. Who was the artist that did a surprise performance with One Direction when they played Madison Square Garden in 2012? Ed Sheeran. He played little things with them, which he also wrote for them. Which member of One Direction dyed their hair for charity in 2013 and what color was it? It was Louis, and he dyed his hair red, much like me, because 
I don't know, we're best friends. What's the name of One Direction's second perfume? That moment. The first one was our moment, then that moment. All right, that wraps up the trivia section of this video. How did you do? Let me know in the comments. Thank you for playing. Let's get back into our little One Direction career timeline. So the boys kicked off what they call the Where We Are Stadium Tour in April of 2014, which yes, bridges us into a whole new era very quickly. I know we move so fast around here. And yet there's so many things that happen in each era. The Where We Are Stadium Tour was one of One Direction's biggest tours of all time. And it grossed over $290 million in the box office. Dear Jesus Christ, Lord, everyone. Running out of ways to express my shock. They were on the Where We Are Stadium Tour for about six months, which is crazy because they had just finished up their Take Me Home Tour two seconds ago. But the Where We Are Tour was all stadiums, hence the name Stadium Tour, which they hadn't done before. I think the Where We Are Tour is one of the most memorable just because it was the biggest, the production was insane, the stage set up. They didn't really have much of a theme going on in the Where We Are Tour, but the Where We Are Tour opener is pretty iconic. Your heart is pounding, you're gonna dry heave, you're gonna roll over and die on the floor because of that concert intro, and I completely get it. The boys even filmed one of their Where We Are Tour shows as a part of an HD documentary of the full performance that people could watch on YouTube or you could buy it. The performance was in Italy. That video is really iconic. I remember watching it on a road trip to Florida one time to pass the time. It's great when artists release just like an HD version of their performances so you can see if you weren't there. But while we're here talking about where we are, allow me to reintroduce you to the members of One Direction one more time with their new looks. So here we have Louis looking absolutely amazing. It was really hard for me to decide what picture of Louis to put on the wall for this chunk of time because he changed hairstyles so much in this time. His hair was pretty grown out. He had long hair for a while on the Where We Are tour. It was like straight long hair. He had floofy long hair for a while and then he started cutting it. There's just a bunch of different looks for Louis in this time, but he's also still rocking the scruff. He just looks so much older than when we started. That's how time works. Then we have Liam. He looks pretty similar. No longer rocking the bald cut. You know, he's got a little bit of a quiff going on, looking very grown up. Then you have Zayn with his prince hair. Love prince hair Zayn. Very underrated. Nobody talks about her enough. This is what we're going with in the Where We Are era for Zayn. Then we have Niall also joining the quiff club. His quiff was a lot more grown out and long on the bottom this time than it was back in like 2013. And once again, he just looks so manly. Look at his chest hair. I'm crying. Why did he just have that out like that? And then of course you have Harry who is also in his prince hair era, just like Zayn. He grew out his hair very long, very famous. Prince haired Harry, you will always be famous. And then over time, he just kept growing his hair longer and longer and longer. We had long haired Harry. We had bun Harry. It was a great time. He was wearing like headscarves in his long hair to like keep it out of his face. So cute. But they're all just looking so much older. They're looking great. They're embracing the long hair. And bonus, you can see Zayn holding his mic color in this one. Feels like ages since we talked about the One Direction world of colors, but he has the yellow one. Do you remember them? Blue, red, yellow, Irish, and green. While the boys were on the Where We Are tour, of course, there was lots of other stuff going on, including... Louis and Zayn getting caught smoking weed on camera. They were in the car together on the Where We Are tour, like in the city that they were going to that day. Louis was filming Zayn smoking weed and they were both in the video. You can hear them both laughing, having a great time, passing the joint to the people who are driving them in the front seat on their team. And it was leaked by the Daily Mail. <laughs> um, I think the leaked Zooey Weed video is a huge pop culture thing that kind of happened in this time period and like reached outside of the walls of the One Direction fandom. Like it was mainstream news and a lot of people were talking about it. A lot of people were in disbelief. There were parts of the fandom that were up in flames over this leaked weed video. There's people uploading their reactions to it and having discussions about it. People were outraged. Parents were outraged. It was the first time that something like this had ever really happened where there was this huge, like bad or negative scandalous thing that happened with them. I mean, there's some other little things along the way, but I'd say this one takes the cake for like... <sighs> But we have come a long way since the weed video attitude. I think more than half of the fandom now just simply wants to smoke with them instead of being mad at them for smoking weed. Me included, Louis, please. They're little minds. Like, good for them smoking weed before their shows. Good for them. In this time, the boys also released another perfume called That Moment. If you'll remember, we talked about how they released Our Moment. This is That Moment. Don't ask me why they named their perfumes Our Moment and That Moment. 
They had a third perfume too that had nothing to do with our moment and that moment, but the packaging of that moment looks very similar to the one of our moment. They just have on different outfits on the box. They also did an accompanying video for this fragrance that was nothing less than absolutely ridiculous, but it's still a staple. It's still fun. The third perfume commercial that they had was my favorite though, and that's the one that they played during the On the Road Again tour, jumping ahead a little bit. Oops, spoiler. But that one was the best one. In September, they also released this autobiography book called Who We Are. One Direction, our autobiography. The reason I put it down here instead of up here to make a timeline is because it didn't fit up here where it originally was. So don't mind that it's down here. But yeah, this is the autobiography book they released in this time. And this is fun because they did a bunch of signings for it. And that signing has some of my favorite pictures and the promo that they did for it too has some of my favorite interviews. If you were on Stan Twitter, you know, back in this time, a lot of people use those book signing photos as icons or like profile pictures on Stan Twitter. So whenever I see this book, I always just think of those book signings. <laughs> the boys were also doing a ton of appearances during this period of time. They went on Graham Norton. They did Jimmy Fallon. They did the Today Show and they did SNL again. They also worked on a charity single for Band-Aid and went on Sesame Street. Yes, you heard that right. No need to clean your ears out. This is them on Sesame Street. They went on Sesame Street and sang like a children's parody of what makes you beautiful. So hey mom, look I made it, I guess. This is not the first time they've parodied their own song. So really who is surprised? Still kind of interesting that it was on Sesame Street of all things, but you can't say they weren't successful if they were on Sesame Street. By November in this time period, the boys were ready to release their fourth studio album appropriately titled Four. The two singles for this album are called Night Changes and Steal My Girl. Night Changes is a really interesting music video because they did a POV music video truly ahead of their time before TikTok took over. I know. I know. But this was like a POV music video where each individual boy took the camera basically on a date to make it look like you were going on a date with them. And the whole plot of it was that the date ended up going wrong. Look how fast the night changes. So you go on a nice spaghetti dinner date with Zayn, ice skating with Harry, carnival with Liam, on a nice stroll through the park with Louie, and a nice snuggly at home game night with Niall. The only flaw is that every single like hand that would appear in the music video that was supposed to be the viewer was a white hand. A lot of people complained about the lack of diversity and then the music video's director, Ben Winston said, just pretend the hand is a different color. What? Like what? And that's how you respond? They also did the Steal My Girl music video, which randomly featured Danny DeVito. Do I know why? Absolutely not. Let's not ask the big questions. Yeah, but this was an interesting music video. Lots of dancing in the desert. There's a monkey in it. The music video has no correlation to the song whatsoever, but did you expect anything else from One Direction? I hope not, based on the other music videos that they've done. <laughs> but all these singles were leading up to the release of their album Four on November 17th in 2014. Let's take a look at it. Hello, let's talk about Four. So here we have the Four album cover, which I really love. It's just the boys against this plain brown background. And there's a picture up here, a picture up here. And then the back is the same brown background. And then just like a black background for the track list. I'm absolutely obsessed with this album cover. I think it looks so good for the album that's inside of here. Speaking of which, this is what the disc looks like. Just like this blue color with print on it. And then there's a matching blue picture of the boys right here. My camera is not focusing on this, but it's blue and it's like another picture of the boys from their album shoot, which I'm so obsessed with. But this album cover is just so perfect for like the type of sounding album that Four is. It's very, just like this, brown background, the boys on it, Harry with his hat even, and then it matches with the back so perfectly in a way that some of their other albums did not. I love that the back is just that same brown background that the boys are on in the front, and then it just has the track list. This is one of probably, like, out of all of them, I think this is the most cohesive album cover that they did. It just makes so much sense. I don't know who designed this, but they did an amazing job this time. It's definitely the best one. This album is pretty different from the rest of their project. The huge majority of this was written on by the boys themselves, which is again, a huge step up from what they were working with in Up All Night and Take Me Home. Although one of the songs on here, 18, Ed Sheeran did write for them. Ed Sheeran wrote some of their songs on Up All Night too. I don't think, I might have talked about that. But yeah, this featured a lot of the boys' songwriting and some very, very strong songwriting choices, just like on Midnight Memories. So many of the songs on this track list are so highly favored and so well done because they were written on by the boys themselves. I think it has a very different sound to it too. Like, 4 has a very, like, indie rock kind of lane to it, where Midnight Memories was 
kind of rock influence. This one is also kind of rock influence, but also kind of has like some folky indie stuff on it. This is another album that was heavily featured on the Tumblr, like soft grunge, indie girl kind of aesthetic. Four is good for aesthetics though. If you're gonna do something aesthetic wise with your albums and merch, four is definitely the album for it. Like the posters and the album shoot is one of my favorites that they did. I'd say some of the strongest tracks on this album, Ready to Run, Fool's Gold, No Control, Fireproof, Stockholm Syndrome, those are some really good ones. Now 4 was leaked two weeks before it was supposed to come out, like most of their album, but it still performed super well. It debuted at number one in more than 18 different countries, and it made One Direction break another record for having all four of their albums debut at number one. So they just kept breaking their own record over and over again every time they released a new album because it just kept going number one. Four is definitely a favorite album in the fandom, just like Midnight Memories. It's just really good, this soft pop, indie rock, folky kind of sound. It's just really good. It's just good in all the right places, including the album cover and the album shoot and the aesthetic that they went for overall. It's just great. So if you haven't ever listened to Four by One Direction, highly recommend. So one of the main promo things that we got for four was this event that the boys did in Orlando where a bunch of fans got to come and watch them perform and they did Q and A's and a bunch of promo there. This took place at Universal Studios and it was a super cool like exclusive fan event and I eat things like this up. I love them. They still do things like this in their solo careers, like with Spotify, like partnering with them to do little events and one night onlys and stuff like that. After the release of Four and all of its promo, the boys had like a fat chunk of time off, deserved. But then they came back into attention in February of 2015 to kick off their next tour on the road again. On the road again, 2015. Are you shocked? Well, you shouldn't be because they do this much work usually, but I'll give you a pass because I'm kind of shocked too. This chunk of time is kind of unbelievable though because they literally just did the Where We Are tour and the Four album and then immediately went on the On The Road Again tour. The On The Road Again tour had 77 different shows with eight different legs and grossed over $200 million, almost 210. This tour is pretty random and unthemed and misplaced, which is probably because it was a Honda Civic tour, which is like a promoted tour. So it was themed after Honda Civic and had these like like little doodles and colors and I don't know. But while on this tour, we have come such a long way from the Up All Night tour when I was telling you about their themed outfits because by the time they did their last tour on the road again, they were literally just wearing t-shirts and jeans every single night, like white t-shirts, black t-shirts, every night on the tour and that was their looks. For the most part, there were some shows where Harry would be wearing like a button down, but it was just very unthemed, very Honda Civic. At the time, actually, if you didn't know, this felt like so much of a cash grab that the fandom was kind of unhappy. There was a lot of stands who were like, why are you doing this? Like their team was kind of milking it and had them go on this random Honda Civic tour. So their team just had them go on this Honda Civic tour to make more money and it was kind of random, kind of misplaced but it was still fun you know what I mean for the culture for the girls they did their live shows and it was fun and it was a great tour and it's very memorable but I don't know have the opinion you will about Miss on the road again there were a lot of moments on this tour like for example on this tour was the first time Harry started picking up rainbow pride flags and running around on stage with them and waving them up which was a humongous monumental deal in the fandom at the time and in general and definitely started a trend of more and more and more people bringing their rainbows to shows, which is really, really important. So if you want to check out my documentary on queerness and the One Direction fandom, definitely go watch it. It's called The Counteract. I just love making content about One Direction, I guess. On this tour, Harry also birthed the iconic line, this is a family show or is it? And he started saying that on tour when he was a solo artist pretty often. So it became like a beloved inside joke. During On the Road Again, there was also these two rainbow bears put on display at a ton of the shows. Not every single one, but a ton of the shows. And they became kind of the On the Road Again mascot, like the face of the tour. Am I here for One Direction or am I here for these rainbow bears kind of thing. They were dressed up in elaborate costumes and basically the big one is Rainbow Bondage Bear. And the small one is Sugar Baby Bear, also known as RBB and SBB for sure. They were essentially on display at most On The Road Again shows teaching the fandom about queer history and hardships. To put it very lightly, I had to mention it in this video. I could not talk about On The Road Again without mentioning these gay ass bears that were there and on display. Imagine being a non One Direction stand watching this video and I just said that and you're like, 
No, it happened. I'm not. I, I could never make this up. And the last thing I'll mention about On the Road Again that makes it so iconic is Liam and Louie doing their water fights on stage during the shows. I don't particularly know how this started, but they just essentially kept dumping water on each other, getting revenge. Sometimes they would spray water on each other. Sometimes they would spray like silly string on each other. It was just a whole thing. Sometimes it was Gatorade. There are so many videos of all the times they've dumped water on each other. If you want to go and watch those highlight reels of them doing water fights, I don't know what you like to do in your free time, but maybe it's watch those. About a month or so into the On the Road Again tour, Zayn left the tour to go home for a little bit, citing stress as the reason. There was a lot of rumors flying around at the time that he was really sick or that something was going wrong, etc., etc. He was missing from a few tour shows, and then on March 25th, in 2015, it was announced via Facebook that Zayn would be leaving One Direction. Oh my God, like reliving their entire career like this and then getting to the part where Zayn leaves feels like a twist to my heart. Like I feel like I'm reliving this right now. Like that's so sad. We just did their whole career and now it's like, Zayn's gone, our fallen soldier. That is depressing. OT4. Okay. Anyways, Zayn leaving One Direction was a humongous deal and is easily the biggest pop culture thing that I ever lived to see. And I'm not saying that to like be funny or add comedic effect to this video. I genuinely mean that in the most serious way possible. I've never lived through a pop culture moment like that since it happened. And I don't know if I ever will, we'll see. It's just one of those things where everyone remembers where they were and what they were doing when Zayn left. Thank God I was on spring break when he left the band and I did not have to deal with being at school, but it was a horrible, horrible time. Like bitches were grieving. There was a ton of media outlets and brands and companies and other celebrities posting and tweeting and making jokes out of Zayn leaving One Direction. He also took up five of the worldwide trends on Twitter that day, which is so crazy. There were some fans that immediately left the fandom with him and went to just make accounts for Solo Zane, like right after he left. Other accounts were extremely angry at him and started burning merch and ripping up posters and all the things like that. It was just a madhouse. To take things a step further, a little bit after Zane left the band, he was seen with this producer, naughty boy and that set the fire off even worse people were extremely upset at him for working with the producer right after he just left one direction because i mean obviously if you're with the producer you must be working on solo stuff so there's a lot of people that were really angry at him for that and started taking it out on naughty boy naughty boy made it worse by getting into beef with louis when i say drama these are just some of my favorite memories of being in this fandom like what was that but in the long run all in all, it's great that Zayn left for his mental health and a lot of people now understand why he had to take a step back if you take a look at all the stuff that was going on, especially in that time period and for him personally. So good for him for doing what he needed to do and having a successful solo career afterwards. Anyways, a few weeks after Zayn left One Direction, Niall fell over playing golf on live TV and created this Oh No Niall meme. And that was the talk of the town for a while. So great distraction. <laughs> The Oh No Nile golf falling over thing has been a huge hit in the fandom for a long time ever since it happened. One of those things you just can't not mention. And then also in this time period, the boys were being really active tweeting and posting about the fact that they were working on their next album and getting lots more songs written, which was pretty interesting and exciting because now, like I said, there's only four of them. Suspense and Madness, what is the next project gonna be like without Zayn? This is also the period of time where the boys worked on their third fragrance called Between Us, and I just now realized I forgot to put a picture on the board of Between Us, so I'll put it on the screen. But this is their Between Us perfume. This is the one where the ad for it played inside the arena or the venue for On the Road Again, and that's like a core memory for me for some reason, this ad playing and everyone screaming and freaking out. Also, Niall Crack opened my ass like that onion was born out of this. I'm so sorry. Some things about One Direction and the fandom are not funny anymore. That used to be so funny. But Niall crack open my ass like that onion will never not be funny. Like that shit just gets me. She said Niall crack. <laughs> okay. I <laughs> On July 30th, the boys surprise dropped their new single called Drag Me Down and then performed it live for the first time that same night in Indianapolis at my On The Road Again show Slay. Another core memory of mine is when they perform that for the first time in my city. But yeah, their first official single as a four piece was called Drag Me Down, released while they were on the On The Road Again tour. And Zayn even tweeted about it, like in support of it. 
so cute. The music video for it released just a few weeks later and this one is kind of iconic in the One Direction music video timeline verse because it was the first one they did as a four piece. They filmed it with a very like space theme at NASA. Haha, <laughs> so funny because no one could drag me down. Gravity space. It just makes sense. Then after all this drag me down stuff later in August, the boys officially announced that they would be going on a hiatus at the end of the year and kept continuously promising in interviews that it would only be about 18 months and that they promised they would be back me when I'm a liar. Like that shit's embarrassing. I think conversations about the hiatus are really interesting now because there's been a lot of artists since One Directions who have announced hiatuses and are taking a break from work and then they really do come back. I saw a tweet the other day where someone was pissed at One Direction for continuously promising to come back when they knew that they weren't because it's kind of ruined taking a hiatus for other artists because now whenever someone announces a hiatus, everyone immediately thinks of One Direction and says, I've seen this film before, ha 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 and doesn't really give anyone the chance to believe their fave when they say they come back, which is a really interesting conversation to be had. I kind of agree. But anyways, it's okay that they announced a hiatus because I love their solo careers. I'm a huge solo stan. I'm wearing Louis' tour shirt right now. And I think they're doing amazing as solo artists, except... Liam, girl, I don't know what to say about you, but we will talk about that another time. Anyways, their next album announcement came around in September. They announced that it would be called Made in the AM and a song called Infinity released with it. Not with the album, with the album announcement, Infinity released. They did film a music video for this song, Infinity. As you can see, there is photos of them filming it. We know that they filmed it. We know that there is an Infinity music video but it was never released. This is known as the Fallen Infinity music video that we never got and we probably will never ever get because I mean, they're 10 years past and we didn't get it, so we're probably not getting it. We've just always been failed by the Infinity Music video. It's time to let go. The other single from this album is called Perfect and they surprise dropped the music video in October. This is one of my favorite One Direction music videos, even though they simply just filmed it in a hotel and there was some black and white shots and they were just singing to the camera, laying on the couch i don't know golfing in the hotel but it's still a good one it's really simple but it works and it makes sense the day after perfect release the boys dropped an ep called the perfect ep which featured an unreleased song on it called home home not featured on the made in the am album but still one of their best songs thank god that we got it eventually but then in the beginning of november we got the final music video for them which is called history and it is absolutely gut-wrenching love Basically, the history music video was just a bunch of clips of them throughout their time in the band and throughout their career, just like reminiscing on past memories while also interlaced with clips of them like singing to the camera together and doing silly little dances. And at the end, they like run off the camera and it's just the it's heart wrenching for a One Direction fan. If you're not a One Direction fan, I see how this music video is kind of like, OK, but for people who were there for all the memories in it gut-wrenching. Later after the release of History, One Direction started hosting these Made in the AM listening parties that were taking place, which is always cool when artists do like album listening parties, except some songs on Made in the AM were leaked. Every single thing that they've ever done except for Up All Night was leaked. But then the rest of Made in the AM in its entirety released to the public on November 13th. Let's look at her. Welcome to us looking at Made in the AM. So this is the Made in the AM album cover, just all the boys on the couch together. And then the back, it just has like this black and white picture of them and then the track list my camera's not focusing on it but honestly kind of shocked to say that this one is not cohesive at all i do love the album cover because it's called made in the am and they're all just like chilling on the couch together which kind of speaks to that feeling of like doing writing sessions and studio sessions and all those things like up in the late hours finishing the album kind of thing so i think the vibe of the cover is really cool but then you turn it over to the back and it's this random black and white picture of them with like the orange and the words and i just don't i guess i just don't like the back not very cohesive with the front but i do love the album cover i vividly remember when this picture dropped for the album cover and everyone was freaking out because you can see a little bit of nail polish on harry's fingers and look at him now and then you open it and this is what the cd looks like it's orange huge made in am the theming of this is so interesting in comparison to their other albums because the cds for up all night take me home looked very similar and then the cds for midnight memories and four looked similar and then this one is just orange huge words like it's just such a standout it looks so different 
and so does the album booklet. Made the AM is a really interesting album when it comes to the music because it has such a blend of different sounds. There's lots of like ballad sounds on there, some poppy sounds on there, but then also really heavily rock influenced sounds on there. And then a little bit of that indie folky vibe that they had going on on 4. So it's just like a big blend of all of the sounds that One Direction has experimented with over their time in a band, which is kind of cool considering this was their last one together. So then it's like this big blend of like sort of all the things they're good at, which I like, um, including the songwriting. A lot of this was written on again by the boys themselves. Of course, once you start writing your own music, you're not gonna like take a step back. They continue to write their own songs and I think that's great because a lot of these songs are hits and very good. Uh, I'd say some really strong choices on Me and the M are End of the Day, If I Could Fly, Olivia, What a Feeling. Those are some of the strongest tracks on here, some of the fandom faves. I feel like I say this about every album, but I feel like this is a very favorite album in the One Direction fandom. Like usually when you talk to people, their number one is either gonna be for Made in the AM or Midnight Memories. Um, but a lot of people really rank this one high. The only thing I will say is Made in the AM doesn't feel as themed as Midnight Memories and Four, I would say. Like the songs on those albums feel like they really go together in a cohesive body of work. But this one just feels like such a melting pot to me. This album debuted at number one in the UK, but debuted at number two in the USA which made it so they didn't break another record and charted all five of their albums at number one in the US so this one kind of broke the streak a little bit I guess people weren't as amped up for it as as the other albums but it still charted really well so we can't let that make it seem like they weren't successful it's still charted number two that's pretty high but I will say that the first week sales for Made in the AM were a lot higher than the first week sales for four so that also says something about the anticipation of this album and like the success they've had with the public like I was kind of touching on earlier a lot of the theming in this album has to do with the hiatus and uncertainty of the future billboard says there's a song about losing someone that isn't zane there's also a song about the band being on shaky ground and not knowing what the future is there are songs about love there's a song that is a little more sexually charged it's all over the map which is exactly what i was trying to explain before it's just all over the place it's like this huge melting pot of different sounds and different topics and different themes although some of them are common. It was just a very experimental album, which is so fine if that's gonna be like the last project that you put out ever or for a long while. So I guess I can kind of understand why they did this like big melting pot of sounds. It's your last chance to kind of get everything out there that you wanna get out there. But yeah, Mandy Am has a special place in a lot of people's hearts, including mine. The boys did a lot of really fun promo in the Made in the AM era, probably my favorite era for promo that they've ever done. They did a lot of iconic segments on the Late Late Show with James Corden in this period of time in 2015, including Tattoo Roulette, where, spoiler, Harry ends up getting a Late Late tattoo. Also, another one of my favorites, Late Late Dodgeball, they did with James Corden. And of course, they did a Carpool Karaoke with James Corden, which is another one of my personal favorites. I just love this chunk of time when they were on Late Late in 2015. The Carpool Karaoke is a true gem. Years and years later, we ended up getting unreleased footage from the Carpool Karaoke, which was probably them just milking One Direction for money, but it was still fun, and it was still great to see them going through the McDonald's drive through while they were filming Carpool Karaoke. Okay, some of us just eat up content of them doing anything. Some of us are me. Then on December 13th, they did their final performance as a band together on The X Factor, which is about to make me lose my mental stability because they did their first ever performance together on the x factor torn and then they did their last ever performance on the x factor now why would you do that to my stability they finished where they started and that basically concludes everything one direction accomplished together five eras of nothing but insanity fun not so fun lots of work the most powerful fandom you ever saw in your life bangers haircuts inside jokes outfits the works i really hope you guys like this lengthy timeline of one direction's career it's been my baby my work in progress for literally months now and i just thought it would be so much fun to have all this information in one place for you i hope you enjoyed your time down memory lane you can check out the description for a form where you can request videos from me if you have an idea for something else that you would like to see. Also, definitely check out my social medias down there if you guys want to keep up with me. I do post a lot about being a fangirl in One Direction and all my faves. So follow me on Twitter and TikTok and Instagram or wherever you have social media. I hope you're all doing absolutely amazing, drinking all the water and thriving. And I can't wait to see you in my next video. One band, one dream, One Direction. <laughs>